Chapter Four of Stories of Old Greece and Rome by Emily Kip Baker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four, Minerva. Although the brown-winged spirits of evil were kept busy flying up and down the earth, their mischief-making never reached those immortal ones who dwelt above the cloud-wrapped summit of Olympus. It was, therefore, a most unheard-of happening when the father of the gods complained one day of a terrible pain in his head. Some of the gods were skilled in the art of healing, but no one could relieve Jupiter's suffering, nor tell what might be the cause of his pain. The trouble grew worse and worse, until it was too severe for even a god to endure. So Jupiter bade his son Vulcan take an axe and split open his head. Not daring to thwart the divine will, Vulcan tremblingly obeyed, and at the first blow a marvellous thing occurred, for out of Jupiter's head sprang a maiden clad in armour and bearing a spear in her hand. This was Minerva, goddess of wisdom, so called because she came full-grown from the mighty brain of Jupiter. So wise did the ruler of the gods find this child of his to be, that he kept her constantly near him, and sought her counsel in dealing with the affairs of men, while Juno, his stately wife, stood jealously by, envying the warrior maiden her place at Jupiter's side. Being born equipped for battle, Minerva delighted in war, and had no feminine shrinking from the noise of clashing steel or the cries of struggling men. No Trojan hero gloried in the war more exultingly than she, as she carried aloft the terrible shield of Jupiter, the Aegis, and bore in her hand the mighty spear heavy and huge and strong. When armies met in battle, the goddess was never far away from the fighting hosts, and oft-times a dying soldier, turning his eyes for a last look at his comrades, saw the glint of her spear or the flash of her shield as she led the favoured ones on to victory. But the azure-eyed Minerva was not always on the battlefield, for in spite of her warlike appearance she had many very feminine tastes, and among them was a love of weaving. Often would white-armed Juno taunt Minerva with her unwomanly fondness for warfare, but when the goddess took up her weaving, even jealous Juno could not withhold her praise, for the hand that could wield a spear like a man had also the delicate touch of a woman. Now there lived on earth a maiden named Arachne, who was very proud of her skill in weaving, and boasted that, in the whole length and breadth of the land, there was no one equal to her in this art whenever people spoke with her she could talk of nothing else but her work and if a stranger stopped to rest at the door she would be sure to show him her weaving and ask him whether in all his wanderings he had seen anything to surpass it soon she grew so conceited that she dared to compare herself with the goddess minerva and boasted that her own work was as beautiful as anything that hung in the halls of olympus her friends grew frightened at her rash speech and begged her not to let her foolish pride go too far, lest some whisper of her boasting should reach Minerva's ears. But Arachne only grew bolder, and said openly that she would not be afraid to challenge the goddess to a contest. These words were overheard by Apollo's raven, who flew quickly back to Olympus to tell what he had seen and heard. Minerva had known for some time of Arachne's boasting, but she had not deigned to notice it, now, however, when she learned that a mortal maiden had dared to claim superiority to a goddess, she grew very angry, and determined to punish such presumption. So she cast off her glittering armour, and laid aside her long spear, and went down to earth in the disguise of an old woman. She found Arachne seated on the doorstep, weaving, and as she stopped to admire the girl's work, even Minerva was forced to admit that the weaving was beautifully done. Soon Arachne began to boast proudly of her skill, and told the pretended old woman that she hoped some day to challenge the goddess Minerva to a contest. The listener seemed shocked at these daring words, and begged the maiden to be more humble and not to presume too far, but Arachne only tossed her head and laughed, saying that she wished the goddess would hear her and accept the challenge. At these bold words Minerva's anger broke out, and throwing off her disguise she commanded the astonished girl to fetch two looms and set them up in the doorway. Then she bade Arachne make good her boast. For hours they worked in silence, each weaving with practised fingers an exquisite design in the tapestry, and neither one turning her head to watch her rival's progress. 
when the last thread was tied and the work finished, Arachne looked anxiously at the goddess's loom, and one glance was sufficient to assure her of her own failure. Never in all her life had she seen work so faultlessly done, and the beauty of it was like that of visions in a dream. Humiliated at her defeat, and too proud to endure the taunts that she felt awaited her from those who had heard her boast, the unhappy maiden tried to hang herself, but Minerva would not let the world so easily forget how a mortal had dared to challenge a goddess. So when she saw Arachne's body hanging by a rope, she quickly changed her into a spider, and bade her spin and spin as long as she lived. Thus, when strangers came from all the country round to see the maiden whose skill in weaving had been noised far and wide, there she hung, an ugly black spider, in the midst of her dusty web, a warning to all mortals who presume. Many, many years had passed since Epimetheus and Pandora wandered in the gardens of the earth, and many, many generations of men had come and gone since the day when Deucalion and Pyrrha looked down from Mount Parnassus upon an unpeopled land. Cities had been built, with marble palaces and costly temples. Towns had sprung up on river banks and by the sea. Everywhere man was making for himself a home, and journeying into strange and distant lands. The gods, seated in the council hall of Jupiter, watched the changes taking place upon the earth, and, as each new city was built, and the flames of its altar fires rose up toward the white clouds around Olympus, they smiled upon the work of man's hand, and made it prosper. Nowhere was the worship of the gods forgotten, but in each undertaking the protection of some deity was sought, and a sacrifice offered that success might be assured. Scattered throughout the land, in town or by the wayside, were shrines where the farmer laid his offering of doves, in return for a rich harvest, or a soldier hung some trophy of victory upon his safe return from the war, or a sailor, starting on some uncertain voyage, burned spices and incense, that the gods might grant favouring winds to all those who go down to the sea in ships. But in every city there was one temple more beautiful than the rest, and this was dedicated to that particular deity who had named the city, and was its especial protector. And as city after city was built throughout the fair land of Greece, each of the gods wished to have the naming of it, that he might thereby receive added worship and honour. There was much jealousy among them on this score, and they watched eagerly each thriving inland town or seaport, knowing that in a few years it would become a great city, building costly temples, and erecting statues to the god whom it delighted to honour. So, once when a certain town on the coast of Greece began to grow into a large and prosperous city, there was much dispute in the council hall of Jupiter, as to who should have the privilege of naming it. Perhaps the gods were looking far into the future, and saw what this city was destined to become. But however that may be, the gods and goddesses argued so fiercely over the matter, that Jupiter was obliged to interfere, lest some murmur of this unusual discord should reach the earth. Then, one by one, the various contestants withdrew, until only Neptune and Minerva, were left to dispute over their respective rights to the naming of the city. There being no ground for either's claim, Jupiter at length decided to give the much-coveted honour to whichever of these two should present the most useful gift to the people of the city. Neptune then struck the ground with his trident, and where the earth opened there sprang out a horse with snow-white mane and arching neck and a splendid body on which a king might be proud to ride. The gods and goddesses who had assembled to witness the contest were delighted with Neptune's gift, and waited impatiently to see what better thing Minerva would be able to offer. Surprise, amusement, and contempt were written on the faces of the spectators when the goddess stepped forward, holding in her hand an olive branch. But Jupiter, wisest of them all, did not smile, for he was listening while Minerva told of the great value her gift would have for the people of the new city. She described all the uses to which its leaves, its fruit, and even its bark could be put, adding that the olive branch was to be a sign of peace among all nations, and was therefore of more true service to man than a war-horse, which would bring upon him only bloodshed and disaster. To these wise words the gods were forced to agree, so to Minerva was granted the privilege of naming the city. And, as she was called Athena by the Greeks, she named the place Athens, which it is called to this very day. 
Before many years passed, a splendid marble temple was built on the hill just above the city, and this was dedicated to Athena, whose colossal statue, carved by the famous sculptor Phidias, adorned the interior. They called this temple the Parthenon, and from the ruins that still remain, we know that the hand of man has never built anything to equal it in beauty. End of chapter 4